Welcome, and thanks to all of you for being here today. I'm just honored and thrilled to be moderating this panel on the impacts of tribal government gaming and looking into the future, the next 30 years, um, here at this um, incredible venue at the Brookings Institute. Um, I know Professor Aki started planning this quite a few um, months ago. The reason I know that is he, when he first called me, I was visiting my family in northern Minnesota, and it was 75 degrees and sunny there at the time, so we know that was a long time ago. Um, so seriously, I want to thank uh, Randy and everyone here at Brookings for hosting this important, and we now know, historic event. Um, 1926 was a long time ago, so it's time for an update, and I know we're really excited, all of us, to be here um, to, to really go in depth on this topic. So I did put together a few slides. I couldn't help myself. As a professor, I have a few things to show before we start the discussion. I think they'll kind of lead right into the discussion. Um, and after I go through the slides, I'll go through and introduce each panelist, starting here with um, Saquon Chairman Cody Martinez, moving on to uh, Chairman Stevens, then Patrice Kunish and John Tasuda. And each of them will share for five to 10 minutes on the conference topic. And then we'll open it up for questions. <laughs> Um, the full bio for each speaker is um, in the handout, so I'll just give a brief introduction of each person. Um, so I did want to just get started with the, the logo up, um, behind us, the Saquon Institute on Tribal Gaming. Um, they're one of the major sponsors of the um, program today. Um, I'm honored to be the um, chair of that institute and, of course, to have the chairman of the tribe here and a couple others from the tribe as well. I see. Um, the tribe's chief administra administrative officer, Adam Day, is here, and I want to give him, um, kind of have him hold his hand up because he's also the chairman of the California State University Board of Trustees. Um, so he's here, you know, on behalf of that organization as well as the tribe. Um, the Saquon Institute does a lot of really important work that I'll get into in a moment and I think can help frame our discussion. So Randy mentioned briefly that 20 years ago, the federal government did an impact study of all gambling policy in the United States. And I just wanted to mention and, and point out that like this conference, it really singled out the tribal government gaming industry um, and, and really encouraged that each gambling industry segment is evaluated independently from each other. And again, I think that's really important that we're focusing on tribal government gaming today um, since we do have as each se segment does, our own distinct set of issues, communities of interest, and balance sheets of assets and liabilities. And I know in the afternoon we'll be hearing specifically um, some of the research then pr that's been produced since then. In fact, that was one of the, there's a full chapter of this report, which of course was written only you know, 11 years after the passage of, of IGRA, that is dedicated to uh, research recommendations and really putting the impetus on, on different government entities and, different, and the gambling industry itself to produce research about the impacts of each gambling industry segment. So in this case, the quote, the commission recommends that state and tribal governments consider authorizing research to collect and analyze data that would assess gambling-related effects on customers and their families resident in their jurisdictions. So we know that um, the tribal government gaming community really stepped up. Within only months of that report being produced, NIGA created the NIGA Library and Resource Center, the first national repository for um, studies of tribal gaming, which again, there weren't a lot at that time. Many of them were stimulated by the production of the report, by the commission's work itself, and then by NIGA creating this resource center. Um, it's a clearinghouse for data and a real commitment to telling the tribal stories, which again, are very unique from the other industry segments in, in the gambling industry. And uh, again, NIGA was also very generous in funding the first national impact study of tribal gaming through the Harvard Project on American Indian Economic Development. And a number of the people involved in that project are here today, which you'll hear from later. Um, only a few years later, the Saquon tribe, again, we're thrilled to have the chairman here, um, created the Saquon Institute on Tribal Gaming. And again, very unique in their commitment to funding research um, this is one of the only places to go if you want to do research on tribal gaming um, to receive funding. And again, some of the research we'll hear this afternoon or, the, or later this morning was funded by the Saquon Institute. Um, there's a lot of work on public policy and also really always a focus on things that are actionable. Um, what can tribes do with the research? What can casino operators do with the research? <clears throat> so as I said, 
I, I wanted to keep it brief, but I think one of the other ways that we really differ on the tribal gaming side compared to the rest of the gambling industry um, is that there are sort of two objectives um, that tribal leaders in particular have to focus on and, and achieve. One, of course, is, is making money. Um, you know, we talked about, we heard from the chairman, 32 plus billion dollars in gross gaming revenue. So we know that we're, we're seeing very successful enterprises. Um, again, on the left is the Sequan Resort, their, their new expansion, which will be opening next month. Um, and so there's a real um, commitment and requirement of return on investment. Again, these are businesses. Um, we're training at the Sequan Institute, training students to work um, in this industry on the business side. But then the other side of it is the return on community, investing those revenues in ways that benefit the community, not just the tribal community, of course, although this photo is, is an investment of Kumeyaay culture, of course, um, at the Sequan um, Reservation, but also in the local communities. Again, um, some of the research we've done shows that the investment in philanthropy is one of the most important things for tribal employees to know about, for example. So again, there's so much to discuss. I'm gonna stop there and, and lead on to our panel. Um, and start with Chairman Martinez. Um, it's my honor to introduce him. Um, as you can see in his bio, he's the chairman of the Sequan Band of the Kumeyaay Nation, and I'm sure he has a lot more to share. So thanks for being here today. Thank you, Kate. It's a pleasure to be here. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so the topic, again, my name is Cody Martinez. I am the chairman of the Sequan Band of the Kumeyaay Nation. We're located about 30 miles uh, east of San Diego, downtown San Diego in Southern California. Uh, this January, I started my second term as chairman. Uh, I was elected in 2014 at the age of 34 years of age. So I've been heavily involved in our tribal government. Uh, my family's always been a long time uh, family of leadership within the tribe. So uh, definitely um, proud to, to lead the tribe. Uh, Saquon has quite an a interesting story, been at the forefront of Indian gaming, uh, not a part of the early litigation, the Cabazon and Morongo, but doing the same thing that those tribes were tied up in litigation about, and that's, again, trying to operate business to bring economic uh, self-determination, self-sufficiency to the tribe. So Saquon, uh, last year, just celebrated 35 years of success in Indian gaming, a year after year growth uh, from opening as a high-stakes bingo hall in 1983 uh, to, again, uh, having our grand opening celebration for our new uh, expanded resort, which will offer 2,500 class three machines, approximately 300 class two machines, over 80 table games, 12 story hotel tower, Lazy River pools. Um, so with Saquon, we, uh, when I was elected 2014, we had a lot of uncertainty as a, as a tribe. Uh, coming from San Diego County, uh, one of the counties with the most Indian reservations in the county line, 17 uh, approximately, I believe. And out of those 17, 10 casinos, uh, 10 of those tribes operating, for the most part, large casinos with 2,000 machines or, or more. Um, so at the time we came into office, we had our sister tribe, the whole Mobad of the Kumeyaay Nation, uh, coming in with a large commercial investor, uh, Penn National Gaming, and basically all the economists, all of the bankers were basically asking my tribal council, what in the heck are you guys going to do? because uh, they all uh, forecasted for Saquon to be impacted the most at that time. Some forecast, you know, as low as 10%, 30% impact on our gross gaming revenues. So the tribe really had to come up with a strategic plan to embrace that impact and to have a plan to go forward and grow. So myself and my council immediately engaged the governor's office to begin uh, negotiations for a new gaming compact. We knew that uh, a gaming compact was essential to our cornerstone of economic development long term and we needed to have a lot more certainty to the uncertainty we were facing, and that was really key for, uh, to start off with the gaming compact. Uh, California, unique, you know, the, the, gaming, uh, the, gov the state uh, negotiating very hard with the tribes, and again, Saquon was out in front of the lead, and we were able to fend off a lot of the state's uh, in, in position of uh, mitigation with local governments, you know, trying to give a lot, uh, chip away at some of the tribe's sovereignty with local government mitigation, Again, labor, quite a strong force in California, and the tribes were having to make concessions and compromises, again, on labor language. But in the end, we felt like we ended up with a compact that was a model compact. A lot of other tribes followed that model, and um, again, 
were able to take advantage with expansions uh, to, to hold those number of machines. San Diego County alone or Southern California, I believe in the last 12 to 18 months has seen nearly a billion dollars in investment. And I'm happy to say that Saquon with our 200, nearly $240 million project was a, it was a large portion of that. Um, we are investing in our casino. It continues to remain a large uh, cornerstone of our economy. It is on our shoulders, uh, my contemporaries and even the younger generation to continue to diversify our economy, uh, which is a lot of work. You know, I wish sometimes the tribe could be on a little bit further celebrating 35 years in gaming, but I believe uh, you know, each tribe has their uh, different processes and programs and you know, the head counts of the populations are different. Uh, I do believe though Saquon is on a good path to, to diversification and again, supporting those essential government programs and services, the whole um, thought process behind I, uh, IGRA and the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act to have the tribes be the direct beneficiaries <coughs> of their gaming establishments. And I think that is, that is very evident on Saquon. Um, so we look forward to, to growing the industry. One of the things in California that makes it interesting is Saquon's been able to fund a public uh, education campaign and a series of commercials we do annually highlighting Tribe as much more than just a casino. Because again, you ask anybody off the streets of San Diego, Saquon, you know, they know it as a, as a casino. We heavily market in that San Diego market. But uh, so one of the points of our campaign is to educate them on you know, tribal government gaming, the greater impacts to the state of California, which again, Saquon's investment in 2005, you know, having a long-term vision that this data, this research is going to not only just benefit Saquon's efforts, but the, the the industry's efforts, not just in California, but nationwide. Because what we've had to continue to do is educate legislators, educate the public of the benefits of Indian gaming, not just for the tribe, because in Saquon, we employ over 95% non-natives. Uh, we give a, a lot of uh, in-kind services to the surrounding com community through police protection, fire protection, and not to mention our generous philanthropic and charitable campaigns. Um, so we continue to educate, we continue to partner with other tribal governments and, and really protect the industry that we've worked so hard to grow over the last 30, 35 years. And again, continue to educate those younger voters that are coming up, really not having the heartstrings that maybe some of the older voters that supported Prop A, Prop 5 in California to really give those tribes, you know, to support gaming on their own lands. A lot of young people today are fighting for some of those basic, you know, uh, American dream principles that all of us want for our families and sometimes they really don't know the history to differentiate why the tribes should uh, be continue to be supported in their gaming so I think we have to educate especially these younger voters uh, and get out ahead of them so um, it's something that we, we continue to do uh, we are very proud of where Saquon has been and we see the future of indie gaming as, as being robust and strong and uh, from the regulatory side, we're very happy with what we do with our gaming commission, working again as a model gaming commission uh, for tribes being the primary regulators of their, of their properties. So we're very happy and um, we see the Indian gaming uh, industry in the future is very bright. So thank you. Thank you so much, Chairman Martinez. <laughs> Our next speaker will be Chairman Ernie Stevens Jr. from the National Indian Gaming Association. Uh, NIGA, they're based here in Washington, D.C., is the largest intertribal association of tribal governments engaged in gaming. Um, you know, we're looking forward to your comments about the impacts of tribal gaming and what do you see for the next 30 years? Okay, thank you, Dr. Kate, and thank you to the Brookings Institute for having us here. We're very excited about that. And I wanted to remind all you gentlemen, it's Valentine's Day. So <laughs> if, if you think it's just a fun holiday, don't bring any roses home and see what happens. So mine are on, the, on her desk right now. So just wanted to check in with you guys. We, I am always end up on the road, and it's a very special day in my household. I, I've, um, uh, my wife and I have been together 40 years. So uh, she's a beautiful lady. So don't forget about her today. Um, I just, you know, I, I, um, I wanted to also, if I could, quickly introduce uh, our team here. Jason Giles is our uh, executive director. He's from the Mus Muscogee Creek Nation. And Rudy Soto is back there. Uh, uh, um, and uh, Chelsea's right here, uh, Chelsea Blake. Um, 
uh, and I, I apologize if I forget anybody else, but, but Sheila Morago, too, I wanted to point her out here. She's the uh, uh, executive director for Oklahoma Indian Gaming Association and a former NIGA staff, just, uh, just like uh, Dr. Kate as well. So um, we, we say a lot of great things about what we do, but we have a whole family that's, uh, uh, that has helped to pave the way. And on the way over here in the car, we were talking about how my dad and a few other tribal leaders, they just they had very little... Uh, uh, team support here in Washington, and now we got teams, and, and, and when we don't have them, they'll surge here if we call on them. So, and, and uh, we're uh, educated, articulate, but uh, stand strong for Indian sovereignty. And for, so I wanted to just introduce a few of those folks. Uh, Dr. Kate, I, I, um, I think that, that uh, for, for me, I, if I could just uh, add these, I wanted to announce to all of you folks, it, 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 maybe it's a year or so, that, that uh, the Indian gaming uh, 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 industry has overtaken the commercial industry as far as uh, 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 in our in, a, in the world of gaming by about 44 to 43. It might be only about a percent, but we are the biggest in the United States of America. We're very proud of that. Um, we have 250 tribes in 29 states operating 482 gaming facilities, and uh, we uh, generate 32.4 billion in gambling revenue. And when you include the ancillary aspect of it, it goes up to 37.3 billion. We are the 13th largest private employer in the United States of America. And we direct about 300,000 jobs, and, and uh, that more than doubles when you into, uh, take into account indirect employment. Um, and then, of course, we, we spend uh, $340 million on regulation. Our regulators are high, highly educated, experienced, and dedicated professionals. You know, my friend, he t talked about the boogeyman, you know? <laughs> and, and, and I can't even go there because if it, it's a whole other discussion in itself. But it's that kind of discussion that created the Indi National Indian Gaming Association. I can't go back to the, to, to the Rick Hills, the Bill Hu, uh, Tim Wapato, and Gay, and, 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 but my uncle, who is, has passed away now, who was chairman of my tri our tribe for 30 years, he was first vice chairman of NIGA back in the 80s. And again, to put it in a nutshell, um, that w these myths and legends that were created out of the beginning of our attempts to, to find economic development and build a future were built uh, in a way that said we have to deal with these issues. And, and uh, now, with regulation, 340 million, uh, you know, any of those guys that have come to our place, you know, maybe they, got a, a, they may have got in the door, but, you know, everybody's on camera by the time they pull in our parking lot. And we've helped uh, not just deal with the boogeyman, but to deal with, with the local crimes and local uh, investigations. And, and so uh, we are state of the art, and we have prevented, and that wasn't just, it wasn't just a, a, a uh, uh, criminals, or wasn't just uh, uh, it was it was an overall uh, plan to protect our industry from uh, uh, people coming forward to think that Indian country couldn't run a good operation. The Indian country could be subject to a crime and things like that. Well, guess what, folks? We borrowed a few from the industry in Las Vegas for sure to help build our world. But now we have well, our kids are becoming educated. They're graduating, and our kids are now running the operations. That means I'm an old guy. I'm going to be 60 this summer. But, but the, the, we have the professionals now. Before we borrowed, and now we are the professionals. And that statistic is kind of not, not boasting, but I don't hesitate to boast about our tribal chairpersons, our, our managers, and different folks that are running our operations. Indian Gaming, we are the, we are the experts to, uh, in our industry. So uh, I just wanted to just to emphasize that and kind of maybe work off of that boogeyman routine a little bit more. Uh, my friend, uh, Chairman uh, Shoudhury, gave an excellent presentation this morning. I appreciate it very much. Um, you know, the, the, the next 30 years of gaming, you mentioned John Grisham. You know, we had a talk with John Grisham, and he stood down, and he even corrected himself to some extent. Uh, anybody that wants to do that, I mean, we did, uh, Sheila was our, our, our media director at NIGA uh, a, a, a few years ago. I don't want to say that you're as old as I am, but, uh, but she's been around a long time. And we've took on all these different initiatives, whether it's <laughs> TV or radio or whatever, we've took them on. And, and these statistics clearly reflect uh, the success of our industry. So I just wanted to, you know, it, and again, the myth about the rich Indian, you know, uh, uh, there's, there's so much. I didn't pay my student loans off until I was in my mid-40s, you know, and I, I, I've raised five kids. 
all those kids have a college degrees with the support of Indian Gaming with, without one student loan, all my children. And uh, so uh, the rich Indian is, 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 is the one who can, can go to, to the museum and get the real story, the one that can go to their local tribal uh, facilities and learn about their culture and their language and, 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 and go to language class and learn how to make their own uh, 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 tribal regalia. That's the wealth, our culture and our, and our, our religion is, is something that is very uh, important to us. So I, I, I just wanted to say that that much. And, 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 and Dr. Kate, as, as far as the, um, uh, the the land in the trust, uh, did you want me to talk on that? Or you, we come, okay, so, so the land in the trust process, people get a little bit, I don't know, sometimes I call that the boogeyman, you know, because people get all worked up about that. But we just want to reclaim what was once ours. So if we want the whole United States of America back, can you blame us, you know? <laughs> okay, I know media's here. I, I know my executive directors probably say, What's, where's he going with this one? <laughs> but, but we just want uh, uh, to reclaim land to build a future for the next, so, so for the next 30 years, we want to create a better tomorrow. And, and uh, that includes uh, uh, education and, uh, um, housing, uh, more land, and, and uh, believe me, you know, as it relates to Mashpee, I'll say this on the record, we support the fact that we don't, we, that should never take their land out of trust. We believe they negotiated the law, which again, wasn't our law, the section 22 part process. That was negotiated appropriately, which other tribes have done, and we support that. And we, we've been a part of initiatives dealing with this, uh, uh, and we don't support opening up the act, because the act takes care of that. And people that negotiate that process, they deserve that process. So taking that out, 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 of, uh, um, uh, out of trust, we, we don't support that. And, and you know, from our standpoint, uh, we really uh, believe that it's necessary for us to, to, to build a better tomorrow. And we can't do that if we don't have land. And there's so many obstacles to doing that. And how, why can't we? I mean, I'm not, we're not saying we want to establish a trust and, and go to Las Vegas and have a casino there. But why can't we go out into the, to the other parts of the world? I don't want to say the real world because we, we believe we're the, we're the real world. But we want to go out into the world and see the world and establish gaming and utilize our expertise to expand our economic development. And again, it comes back to our children, and, 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 and uh, our need to build our communities to, to the battle of some of the challenges that are, whether they're legal, we have, a, a, this whole world has, has to deal with the, uh, um, uh, drug abuse and gang violence and those kinds of things. We gotta band together to take, to take those out of our communities. And these are, the way, these are the things that help us by bringing them home, expanding our world around us. The land of the trust thing is so, so amazing to us and it's not, you know, we, we're, paying, we're paying beyond our fair share. You know, we have service agreements all around, around this country. And the few that can't come to those agreements, and I know a few, I won't mention them, they're, they're lost. Because this is 2019, and, and we've been doing service agreements and getting, and getting along with our uh, local municipalities for a long, long time. And again, with their job statistics, over 700,000 jobs, we're doing great things. So I think that we really need to understand that the, it's not a boogeyman, the, the, uh, uh, the land of the trust process. It's a normal process that will continue to bring prosperity to not just Indian country. 700,000 jobs, that's a whole lot of folks that may not be Indian, but they're a part of the Indian gaming family. So I think we're, we're, we're doing great things out there, Dr. Kate and I. I could ramble on forever, but again, uh, 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 housing, infrastructure, community development, building schools, nursing home, child care, recreation centers, all these kinds of government function take land and take more economic development. So, you know, we need the world not to be afraid of Indian people expanding our horizons because we've got a long ways to go. And uh, we have a lot of our, our I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to hold, in the next six months, I'm going to hold two more brand new grandbabies, so I'll be up around 17 grandchildren. I, I want these kids to have something to live for, and I want America's children to have something to live for. That's what Indian Gaming's all about. Thank you, Chairman. Wow. Mm -hmm.
all the travel that you do. And we actually did try to plan this event to be done early in the day so people could get home for Valentine's Day. So I hope you catch your flight. And I'll be bringing chocolates. <laughs> hopefully you'll yeah. make it. And I know um, you just came back from, from London, from yeah. ICE, and again, representing Indian gaming, not just here in the US, but even, even um, globally. So again, thanks for all the travel that you do. I know it's a hardship to be away from your family. And many people here obviously travel. Most of us are not from here and have come in for this event. And, and I know you especially are, are out on the road. So thanks for everything that you do. Thank you, Dr. Kidd. I got to see, we went to the class. We were hosted by Dr. Leah Gardner. And she was an intern. When I first, uh, uh, with Sheila and I were at NIGA and, and Dr. Kate was there, she was an intern. Now she's a professor there at the University of London. She's a big shot. She still looks the same, though. I know. Yeah, so we're very proud of her, too. Yes. Well, thank you. Our next panelist is Pat Patrice Kunish. She is Assistant Vice President and Director of the Center for the Indian Country Development at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. Um, she's also of Standing Rock Lakota descent, and she's going to talk about how gaming has supported the prosperity of Native nations and some of the work that they do at their center. So welcome. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. I'm really, really happy to be here. I I'm really feeling sort of the, the momentum and the, the momentous occasion of being here uh, 100 years post Miriam Report. So I work with the Center for Indian Country Development. It started about three and a half years ago, and I was hired to sort of breathe life into the Center for Indian Country Development. Brand new thing for the, for the Federal Reserve to really focus on Indian country. Of course, we have Indian country uh, in, in all of our 12 districts. So we located it in Minnesota, or the Minneapolis Fed, I should say, but it's on a national platform to really take a close, deep look at the economics of, of Indian country and, and maybe in a, in a very unique way apply an economics or an econometrics model to economic and community development. Miriam Jorgensen was, is on our leadership council. We've had other, uh, Dante Desiderio, who really helped inform us about what are the burning issues in Indian country. Our mission is really to, to look at and support the wealth and prosperity of Indian country. So often we hear about the disparities and the gaps and, and the poverty and, and, and such and so forth, but we know that there's tremendous wealth and we talk about that in terms of human capital wealth and we talk about it in land wealth. So we're, we're here to support from a, from a data perspective, and I really appreciate John Adev's comments about data and the importance of, of mining that data to understand the real lived experience in Indian country. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit this morning about one aspect of that data, and it's the labor force. I did not know the numbers that Ernie was telling us that, um, did you say the 13th largest employer in the United States yes. with over 700,000 employees? That, that is awesome. That is truly phenomenal. And I, I wish I had known those numbers, but I am blown away. But if you take a look at the chart behind me, we can see where these numbers um, really lie in the context of reservation jobs. So this is sort of a labor perspective of, of Indian gaming. And you're going to notice two really high bars. The highest one is the sector for arts, entertainment, and recreation. And that is, of course, Indian gaming and all the amenities that go with Indian gaming, the hotels, the restaurants, and uh, the resort facilities. I should mention or explain that the red line is, is the parity line. So we took... Uh, uh, across 277 reservations. We took a look at all the different job uh, sectors and we compared that to um, uh, four, 514 nearby counties. So we're looking at reservation jobs and comparing it to, new, to, to nearby counties. So the red line is where the two meet in, in terms of parity. So when you see those two big lines, you can say, what's happening there? Well, the tallest line, which is um, <clears throat> arts, entertainment, and recreation, is the gaming. And that's about almost uh, four and a half times uh, the jobs that we see in nearby counties. 
The next highest uh, bar here is uh, tribal admin, or I should say public administration, which represents a government, tribal government. So those are the two largest by far employers in Indian country, and, and, and that's you know, pretty natural. We have tribes that have gaming, are, are supporting the economy, are, are, are creating jobs, uh, not only for their communities, but also employing uh, uh, people from nearby counties. And we know that tribes as, as self-governing nations also are running um, large governmental institutions providing public services to their, to their community. So in that public administration, we see over two and a half times parity that, tribal, uh, that the tribes are employing employees. So what does this mean? I, I, I think there's a, and, uh, just to take a look at what's below the parity line, we see uh, fewer jobs in the sectors of transportation and warehousing. We see uh, a big dip in terms of the manufacturing sector, uh, utility sector, and of course, um, agriculture, fishing, and forestry. So those are some of the areas where we're not at parity with, with uh, local counties. So what, what I take away from this is that Indian gaming has definitely boosted reservation jobs. I mean, it's been a tremendous boon for jobs, employment opportunities. And of course, with those jobs come benefits. And those benefits are truly necessary. The health benefits, the retirement benefits, those are what recreate wealth and well-being. And we're so, so very proud of that. But we also see that this, uh, the, these jobs are skewed. Obviously, that there's a high concentration in just a few of these sectors. And uh, I should also mention, which you don't see on this, on the, on this graph, that it's very uneven. You know, this is just sort of a, a national amalgamation of the data. But the job sectors really vary uh, by reservation and, and by region. So what we know is that there are a lot fewer uh, establishments per person. A lot fewer establishments per person, even though we have these really high uh, job sectors. But we have larger employers. And of course, the tribe is the largest employer, both on the gaming side and the, and the public administration side. And then, quite frankly, that concerns me. That concerns me that we have this huge concentration of, God, of, of jobs in Indian country uh, from tribal government. So although we have jobs per person on par or better with local communities uh, due to these large businesses, reservations do not have a diverse workforce. We just do not see a private economy. We don't see an economy outside tribal government. And so assuming that gaming is maintained at its current level, and assuming that we can weather the impacts of government shutdown or competition, I think that this really foretells a, a concern and a need to look at diversification for the future. <clears throat> and when I think of diversification, I think there are many, many opportunities where we can invest the gaming revenue and support uh, uh, broadening up the sectors for employment. So I, I, I think we need to look at getting these jobs uh, more closer to parity with uh, the nearby counties. I think we need to really encourage private sector businesses to lead the way. And tribes, I think, are at the forefront of encouraging this private economy. I think they, as, as we've heard uh, uh, Chairman Stevens say, you know, we need to build the workforce within. And we're seeing a tremendous amount of good job opportunities already being created through the IT and human services, financing, and accounting. So as we see this workforce skills being developed, we also need to apply it across all spectrum of, 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 um, of workforce development uh, within uh, reservations. I think tribes really must govern to facilitate and encourage external investment and I think they also need to, uh, to target tribal resources to key economic investments. And those investments are certainly our infrastructure, as we've heard. Your broadband is, is, is essential. It's an essential pillar of economic development. And Indian country is woefully behind 
in making sure that, that broadband is accessible throughout um, all our Native communities. I think we also need to look at the institutions, the government institutions that, that support uh, the reservation. And those include the tribal court systems and, and, and the tribal laws. So tribal government officials taking a look at diversification should be looking at things such as uh, do we have a, a fully staffed tribal court system with tribal laws that provide um, uh, support and incentives for lending. And that includes recourse and remedies available through tribal courts. It also means that we have institutions um, such as the Model Tribal Secure Transaction Act. We need a collateralized lending system. We need to have opportunities for, uh, for the uh, a commercial code to be fully realized and developed so that private entrepreneurs and investors have a great opportunity to look at the reservation as that golden opportunity. I think there are about six elements of, of economic diversification as a strategy that I'd like to share with you. And I mentioned the first, which is good governance. It absolutely has to have a supportive business climate on the reservation. I think we also need to look at delivery of public services. Every government provides essential governmental services, and those need to be done in the most efficient um, and reliable way. We've seen a lot of pain through the government shutdown, and we've seen a lot of vulnerability in many of our communities. So how can we take a look at this as a lesson to uh, support these public services to our Native citizens? I've mentioned the collateralized lending system <clears throat> and the remedies and recourses for private lenders or private uh, investors. Most importantly, I think, or as importantly, we need to be able to use trust lands effectively. We have almost 70 million acres of, of reservation land. 60 million are in trust. We've just had over a million acres being uh, consolidated through the land buyback process. But from my, uh, from my experience and, and my uh, review, these lands are locked. We cannot really tap into these lands because of so many bureaucratic processes and, uh, uh, and, and review by the Bureau of Indian Affairs and title status reports, environmental reviews, title insurance, all of these take time, they take money, they discourage a lot of investors over time because time is money. So we need to unlock this potential of Indian country and we need to have a, a streamlined, uh, normalized um, uh, land leasing process. Chairman Stevens talked about education, and this is an incredibly important part of, of diversification and, and future economic growth. We know that educational opportunities, pillars of economic development, economic mobility. We talk about return on investment, return on community. I love that phrase, Dr. Kate that education is surely the main return on investment. So it has to be a pipeline, and we have to take a look at it from the very earliest stages of early childhood development, create a pipeline all the way through, the, uh, through our adult learners and, and, and apply that uniformly across the board and track and follow not only college education, but getting our students uh, through high school, through vocational training, and really get them into the jobs that add value uh, back to the, um, to the community. And so we address the brain drain problem with the brain gain um, uh, perspective. And the last point I would say is publicly financing uh, the need for infrastructure. That tribes really need to get into the business of developing bonding capacity for the housing. We know that uh, one of the premier programs, the HUD-184 Guaranteed Loan Program, 93% of those funds are for housing off the reservation. So if we want to attract good workers, if we want to build the workforce, if we want to support this education, we need to provide safe, secure, stable housing and create a really robust housing market. Uh, and we need to do that with a, a very strong, robust uh, public bonding capacity. So those are my thoughts on the future of, 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 of gaming, workforce development, through the lens of, of, of labor economy. Thank you. Thank you.
right, our final panelist is John Chasuda. John is Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs at the Department of Interior. Um, he also um, is a NIGA, former NIGA employee. I'm back sorry, John. 20 I'm some years sorry. ago. It's okay. <laughs> it was, sorry, he's done a lot since then. Um, so, John, we did hear from uh, John Adev and NIGC this morning. We'd love to hear more about the role of the BIA in tribal gaming in particular, and also just some of your thoughts for the trends in the next 30 years. Um, thank you, Kate. Uh, I also want to start out by thanking Brookings and uh, Dr. Aki uh, for including me in and your patience in staying with it and including me even though we weren't sure that we would be back working at this point and I would be able to participate. So thank you very much for that. Um, <clears throat> and I'm really, uh, uh, I, I have to say personally, I want to thank you as well. Um, I do have a personal affinity for, for Indian gaming. Uh, Indian gaming came around right about the time I was getting out of law school. And uh, one of the first uh, lawyer conferences I went to, uh, uh, the, the keynote speaker was Tony Hope, the first commissioner of the NIGC. He had just been confirmed. And so um, I've been fortunate in many ways to, to have been uh, an observer and in some ways participant um, in Indian gaming uh, from almost the very beginning. And, and uh, uh, I've seen the good things it's done. I've been in a lot of the discussions that have happened. Uh, I've also been very fortunate to uh, work with uh, one of the tribal leaders who was at the forefront uh, before IGRA. And uh, I know he and, uh, uh, ha and uh, for or former chairman James Billy have a Friendly competition about who got the idea to have a bingo hall first, but um, <laughs> so, um, but but I, I've really been lucky to be involved with folks like that uh, from the tribal side, um, and then uh, on the opposite side, uh, I have the great fortune to uh, come to D.C. and work uh, with NIGA, uh, with former Chairman Rick Hill, and with Ernie, and um, to really uh, you know be part of the discussions that went on. They were very important discussions. Um, with the Gambling Impact Study Commission, and there was a follow-up Public Sector Commission, and and uh, that was a that was a great deal of work, but also in the discussion about getting good facts and solidifying your data to push back to people. Those are important exercises, I think, for Indian Country and for the tribes to learn really learn how to do that for the first time in a big way. And uh, so I'm proud to have been part of that. Um, and also, though, um, I had the good fortune to uh, spend some time on the Hill working for. Uh, two uh, not only unique men, um, but also unique in that they were both involved in the enactment of IGRA. I worked for Ben Nighthorse Campbell. Uh, when he was in the House, he was part of the team that uh, pushed uh, what became IGRA out of the House to the Senate. And then, of course, I had the really good fortune to work for the late Senator McCain, who was one of the primary drafters on the Senate side of what became IGRA as we know it today. So um, I've been very fortunate to, to, like I said, to have been part of that. Uh, had some spirited discussions with Chairman Stevens and NIGA over the years about potential changes to IGRA and uh, all this. But I think it's always been, um, and I, I appreciate Chairman Stevens always uh, having a, a good and honest dialogue, though, um, on whatever side of the fence I've been on. And uh, I think it's made it better for all of us. So, uh, again, I appreciate that. Um, I want to um, kind of, uh, I, actually, I, th I, I thank you for letting me go last, because I think Part of what I want to say, and we'll pull in some of the other, uh, the other comments made, but also I really want to focus in on um, the role of the department. So when IGRA was enacted um, 30 years ago, um, they decided to divvy up some of the what became responsibilities for the federal government um, in a little different way than they were be being handled at the time. So when IGRA, before IGRA was enacted, the Department of Interior had virtually the sole responsibility, other than criminal prosecution, which was at DOJ, uh, but really the sole responsibility for working with the tribes on any business, including what became Indian gaming. Um, coming out of IGRA, um, in its wisdom, Congress decided to divvy up those responsibilities a little bit. Um, but one of the important roles um, that was kept with the department, um, and particularly with the, uh, the assistant, or you know, is, uh, is uh, handled by the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs Office, is the land aspect of Indian gaming. And, and we can't have Indian gaming without land, right? And, and uh, in some ways, we can't, uh, it, it's, it's really hard to be Indian tribes without land. We're so tied to it, our, the very notions of sovereignty that we depend upon, um, you know, derived from 
uh, traditional notions of, of um, sovereignty and land and control over that. So, um, so the department um, was re retained that portion of the responsibilities for that. Um, <clears throat> And uh, one of those really important roles is determining what is Indian land under the act that qualifies um, to conduct a gaming activity on. So um, the department has, has uh, been part of that again from before IGRA through IGRA. Um, there's a lot of determinations that go on. And one of the, but one of the, the, the uh, fortunate aspects, we talk a little bit about uh, all the side benefits, et cetera, um, is that the department has been able to be part of uh, the growth and the uh, and to see the benefits that the tribes have received from Indian gaming, and um, acknowledge right up front, right, that Indian gaming was a tribal initiative, it was, and it's probably why it's been so successful, right? It wasn't a government initiative. Um, the tribes came up with the idea, they pushed it forward, uh, sometimes in spite of the government, um, sometimes dragging the government with them. Um, <clears throat> but as uh, Chairman uh, Chowdhury said, you know, there's three primary purposes: uh, promoting economic development for tribes promoting self-sufficiency, and uh, promoting strong tribal governments. And without a doubt, it has been enormously successful fulfilling those purposes, right? Um, in fact, um, many tribes have become uh, almost, uh, uh, or have become very dependent upon this source of government revenue to, uh, to really try to meet the needs of their people. Um, historically, um, you know, depending, dependence upon federal revenues uh, to provide services in Indian country has not always been met, and the tribes have been able to supplement that. Some tribes have been able to come completely self-sufficient and told the federal government, we don't need you anymore. We're going to, we were able to do it all ourselves. So uh, it has been enormously successful in that front. One of the spillover um, effects and uh, one of the, uh, the pleasures and the challenges that uh, we at the department face sometimes is the spillover effect. Um, um, by far, the spillover effect has been positive for all the surrounding communities, not Indian primarily, um, but the, as we know, and, and the efforts through research and stuff have shown that the benefits to the surrounding communities, to tribes, from Indian gaming is undeniable. Uh, we, we've created business opportunities for local businesses. Uh, we've provided jobs not just on the reservation, but all around the reservation. The vast majority of the employees uh, come from the surrounding communities and from the tribal community. It's provided an opportunity for them to interact in positive ways that they didn't really have a chance to interact with before. And so those benefits, um, to, to my mind, are almost as valuable as the economic benefits. That ability uh, to really become part of, uh, as many tribes talk about it now, the, the uh, partnership of governments in their region, in their area, all the way up through state governments. So. Um, that's been, that's been a, a positive success. So we're now 30 years in, and in many ways, it's a mature industry, right? Mature because the tribes have developed these relationships. Uh, they've been able to provide a lot of these benefits and mature in an economic sense. Um, so uh, for many tribes now, they have, been, they have added on uh, extra amenities um, and uh, things to, to sort of fully, fully capture as much of the economic activity that they can through the gaming uh, on the reservation. And so um, what happens when you have a mature industry? Uh, you start to develop competition, right? Um, and uh, in some ways, this is great, right? Because it's been so successful that it's actually created competition among tribes in some regions, right? Where, where they're now having to compete with each other. And that's certainly much better than not having any basis to do that on, right? So, so that's been successful, but that's, that's uh, something that uh, we have to consider. Um, and it's also been so successful that it's actually... Um, cr you know, created the desire by non-Indian entities, i.e. commercial gaming primarily, uh, to come in and try to compete with the tribes as well. And so uh, I, think the tr I think tribal leaders should pat themselves on the back for being that successful as well, that they have actually made other business people jealous and they want to come and compete with them. So um, that's great, but again, competition creates pressure as well. And um, at the end of the day, for, for many tribes, um, as, as almost everybody that's spoken so far this morning have said, uh, even given the level of success that tribal gaming has brought to tribes, um, they still have additional things that they want to do with their money. Needs to be met, uh, services, education, to all these things. And so um, when you look at the future of gaming, I think you have to think about now what's next. So uh, what comes next? Um, if you have competition, uh, in your area or with your business, um, 
You can compete directly against it, uh, which the tribes are doing. Um, you can try to um, uh, hopscotch it, sidestep it, or you can try to get away and avoid it completely. Um, so for, for us, and again, let me pull this back to uh, the, the legal concept in IGRA of what is Indian land eligible and appropriate for gaming um, is where do you go then? And uh, there are provisions in the act, very limited provisions, um, that allow a tribe to uh, look at other opportunities off of their immediate reservation. And sort of generically, whether you want to call it a boogeyman or whatever, they're referred to as off reservation. Um, now, sometimes that's unfair. There are, there are uh, three exceptions in IGRA, which I don't really consider off reservation. Um, but you know they have to do with tribes who just got recognized or were restored and never had the opportunity in recent times to have their reservation. Tribes who had land taken illegally and can present a land claim. Those were all. Those are three concepts that Congress considered and, and thought was fair to include in the act whenever uh, they they uh, promulgated it in '88. Um, but there is the fourth one, and um, this is sort of what's really, to my mind, what classifies as real off-reservation gaming, in which you uh, they're really. There's not a legal requirement that it be, um, th through, through the gaming aspect, that it be tied to the reservation. In some ways, it's purely political because uh, all you have to do is get the consent of the governor. Um, and so um, that, that is uh, uh, for, for approval of the gaming aspect. Um, the department, of course, still has to go through the process of determining uh, whether the land is appropriate to be taken into trust, assuming it's not already in trust, uh, for the tribe. So. Um, that, that's a, um, a special legal situation created by IGRA, um, and uh, so uh, a unique um, opportunity, or uh, if you want to call it that, the tribes can look at to avoid competition or to, to move around competition. Um, and then, um, you know, there's always the opportunity as well that uh, commercial gaming has looked at us as competition and we can look at them. Tribes can also, and some tribes are doing this, getting into commercial gaming themselves. They're competing head to head off the reservation around the country sometimes, uh, far away from, from where the, the reservation is. They're competing with commercial gaming and putting the expertise that tribes have developed um, you know, in this industry over the years uh, to work uh, in a commercial context and, and often being uh, very successful competing head to head with commercial gaming. So um, I think when we look ahead at gaming, uh, Indian gaming uh, in the next 30 years, those are some things that, that come up. Those are things we have to think about. And if we talk about um, you know, where uh, the federal government goes with this, you know, one interesting conversation we always have to have is about uh, what, um, what is appropriate uh, both to take into trust for a tribe, because those are unique circumstances, really. Um, even in, even in uh, the context of the federal government uh, you know, acquiring property, um, and then is it appropriate for gaming? And um, one of the policy um, discussions that tribes um, have had several times over in recent years, and I think as competition and as these things uh, continue to materialize uh, over the next 30 years, um, there's gotta be a discussion about what is Indian gaming and what is unique about it. Because the farther, to my mind, I would say this is me personally, but the farther attenuated the gaming enterprise becomes from the reservation, um, then the less it looks like Indian gaming, right? It looks more like commercial gaming. Uh, when it's on the reservation, you have direct benefits. You have the jobs for people that live on the reservation. You have housing on the reservation. The further you get, it looks more just like money. And who treats gaming, the gaming business, just for money? Commercial gaming does. So uh, those, I think, are concepts that tribes and tribal leaders are gonna, and policymakers are going to have to struggle with over the next 30 years. Um, if gaming is going to continue to grow and, and be successful. Let's, let's get another round for our whole panel. Thank you, John. Um, we do have time, about 15 minutes, for questions from everybody here in the audience. And um, since each panelist has a very specific area of expertise, I just want to note that not every panelist has to answer every question. But certainly, you're welcome to target it to a person on the panel or just open it up. So does anybody have any place they want to start? And you all have microphones on the table if you want to. Yes, if you want to step up and. That's 
Yeah. So one of the things that my husband and I were talking about on the way in is, is our 29-year-old who spends all of his time on, on uh, you know, video games and our 11-year-old grandson whose uh, big deal is Fortnite, which is a video game for those of you who don't have grandsons or young children that 125 million people are playing. And, you know, Patrice mentioned how there's a lot of places we don't even have fast Internet. So, uh, you know, what are we thinking of? What are we, uh, how are we approaching how we're going to continue to compete as the little old ladies age out and aren't there for the, you know, for the slot machines? And there's more and more young people who are, who are playing eSports and, um, you know, what, anyhow, I guess that's the question. What are you thinking? What's going to be done? Well, I think it was interesting. Um, I think I'll throw that to Chairman Martinez since he le leaned over and said, you know, we just spoke about the next 30 years of tribal gaming and no one mentioned the Internet. So, mm -hmm. so here we go. Chairman, do you have anything to say about what you, your property does around? Well, technology... Practice? You know, just for the guest experience, technology, uh, you know, at Saquon, we've been always wanting to embrace uh, technology for, to make the experience for the, the gamer and the customer more user-friendly, easier. Uh, and so Saquon has done so, not just for the customer enhancement part of it, but because internet gaming, uh, the internet has is, is been floating around in California. It's actually been a very divisive issue, uh, pitting tribe against tribe. Uh, some see it as, as a technology that cannot be ignored, that should be embraced, and the sooner the tribes get behind it, the better. Others have the opinion that it's no secret the tribes don't have the technology, the, the database, the platforms to operate these types of, of gaming, so they would have to partner with these commercial operators or outside entities. Once those people are involved in the business, they're not going to want to step away from that business. And again, the tribes have worked so hard to, to uh, operate and manage and regulate their properties, it really starts to change it. Uh, so it makes a lot of people nervous. Um, so again, that has worked out into the political arena in California as, as a stalemate. And I'm sure it'll be uh, continue to come up again with sports wagering. I'm not so much sure about internet poker. Uh, so what we try to do is make our, our floor, I mean, a lot of the slot producers, you can see the games are taller, bigger, more in, uh, engaging and interactive. Uh, so again, they can somewhat... Uh, attract a younger player, but a lot of the operators have also been down the path of over-investing for the millennial. You know, that the market is still established with the older player, uh, f uh, 45 plus. Um, so there's a lot to still be worked out, especially when we're at in California. We'll see where the tribes, but uh, early signs show that a lot of pos uh, positions have not changed since the last session. Um, but how, how do we embrace it? How do we embrace the internet? Very good question. Uh, but uh, so as the reality of a lot of these forecasted revenues come to play out, that's a little bit of an awakening because they uh, have not become a reality of some of these, these numbers, 300 million, 500 million in lost tax revenue potential to the state. Uh, so as we try to see where, where things, where the reality is, where the profitability of, of the tribe's ability to, to participate in these things, it's to be determined. But the strong argument, especially from our younger members, is you cannot forget about the internet. It's there. It's a part of all of their lives. The smartphones are continually uh, there. And how can, how can we take a look at being a part of that, I think, is something our tribal government is looking not to be left behind, but to be in the forefront uh, and to grow with that segment of the industry. Well, and as, as you mentioned, and as Patrice, I think, mentioned, too, you know, there's a movement within Indian country and, and more generally nationally to <coughs> understand broadband, broadband access as a civil rights issue, that access um, really is something that, that people have to have, have to have to just participate in, in society today. Right. Um, I do want to also ask if Chairman Stevens wants to speak maybe from the perspective of NIGA. I know that the NIGA events often address this issue of how to attract Millennials, um, and maybe mention yeah, some of your policies. You know, policy I think that that's clearly one of our initiatives. You know, the free play initiative within gaming; those kinds of things help us to develop that. Uh, we've been watching the internet development over the years and continue to uh, uh, prep for that initiative. And you know, it goes back to the sports betting thing too. You know, the 
the uh, uh, we are we have two tribes that are, are, are Santa Ana Pueblo I think and Mississippi Choctaw that are moving forward with this so so we're ready but you know we like our gaming in the heart of our community we like our slot machines we like our our, our table games and we like economic development in your country but those are viable economic opportunities and we want to stay focused on those any way we can expand our energy to better suit our community and build our future for the next 30 years. These are key components. But uh, if I could just read you uh, where on the internet one, the tribes have developed the principles over the time. And, and those principles are that tribes must be acknowledged as governments with, with authority to regulate gaming. Tribal government internet revenues will not be subject to taxation. Customers may access tribal government internet gaming sites as long as internet gaming is legal where the customer is located. Tribal rights under IGRA and existing tribal state compacts must be protected. IGRA should not be open for, the, for amendments and tribal governments must receive positive economic impact in any federal internet legislation, legislative proposals. And Indian tribes must possess the, Indian tribes possess the inherent right to opt into a federal regulatory scheme to ensure broad-based access to these markets. This is a resolution that was established by NIGA uh, through the, uh, through the uh, work with the member tribes, uh, through several consultations with the member tribes. It's signed by me and, and the secretary of NIGA's board, Ms. Uh, Paulette Jordan, he, he was here. My uh, opportunity to introduce our board secretary, Paul, that is just off of a very energetic uh, uh, run for the uh, governor of Idaho, and, and she has uh, uh, served two terms in the state House of Representatives in Idaho, and she's one of our, our, our strong advocates for Indian gaming. Just wanted to take a chance to introduce uh, Paul. Thank you. Patrice or John, do you want to weigh in on, on e-commerce maybe as a <clears throat> diversification tactic? For yeah, tribes? yeah. I, I have a couple thoughts running through, and it may not relate specifically to gaming, but it does relate to public safety. And we have heard from, from several um, reservation communities that the, that the broadband internet access is, is such, a, such a need, not just for distance learning, but for telemedicine, but for basic homework. We had, a, we had a community where uh, many of the families would sort of hover around the casino and draw the broadband internet access so they could do their homework. And uh, in one community, they were hovering around the police department and it was such a drain on, their, on the reception of their services that they, the police department wasn't able to get um, the calls in and so forth. So I can't under, uh, underestimate the, the, the need for, for these kinds of services. But from an e-commerce perspective, we are seeing fin you know, the fintech aspect of, of lending big time in Indian country. And the largest lender in Indian country is Rocket Mortgage. I mean, Rocket, um, uh, Rocket Lending, uh, what's, what's the name of it? It's, um, it's, it's an online vendor that is, uh, for, for home mortgages, uh, the, the largest lender in Indian country. And I'm wondering, how do they get access to the internet? How does the, the lender secure the loan and so forth? But in, in all respects, we're seeing fintech and, and, and the technology coming uh, to be much more a part of, of the lending spectrum in Indian country, which raises a lot of jurisdiction issues and enforcement issues and something I think we need to take a closer look at because uh, these are very valuable tools and the way they are being applied and providing resources, financial resources to Indian country is, is, is exceptionally important. Um, what, broadband is uh, obviously very important. So um, we're in the midst, uh, the president, uh, as you know, has a nationwide uh, rural America broadband outreach initiative. Um, and uh, the assistant secretary is working extremely hard to make sure the Indian country is part of that. Um, but it goes uh, beyond even just broadband. It actually um, also energy infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of hard to run your laptop, get, get broadband if you don't have some place to plug it in once your battery runs out. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's also, um, you talk about kids at home and uh, in Indian communities, having a stable um, energy infrastructure for their communities is part of that as well. So um, that's tied into, uh, for our work anyways, tied into the broadband initiative. 
Uh, Dr. Kate, I think is, and Patrice kind of uh, um, uh, addressed it too. The, 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 the next 30 years, we should make the top priority the internet and broadband, these things that come to our communities. We, we take, have so many myths and legends about the, the, the rich Indian, you know, and, and for the most part, Indian folks, if you look at the majority percentage wise, they're on the outside looking in, mm -hmm. you know, and the only thing, that, like when I talk to the, 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 a, a, broad, a broadband and access to technology, that would make us wealthy. And that's what we need in Indian country. And, uh, uh, th this is something that's so vitally important. So we need not focus on. Uh, uh, there's reasons that that some of the tribes have more than than others, location and car count and all that stuff. But for the most part, Indian people all over this country need access, mm -hmm. so that we can build a better tomorrow. And that's why I always talk about our tradition, and our, our our culture, and those young people in our communities. They they are our leaders today because they got to take a giant step forward for us. And and to do that, we need access. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, again, I, I think we're out of time, and I want to thank everyone for being here and thank our panelists and, and look forward to the next panel. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.